Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. Check out our Instagram, Instagram.com slash Great Detectives. I do want to encourage you to check out our other podcast. In particular, The Amazing World of Radio. Go over to amazing.greatdetectives.net. And coming up tomorrow is the finale of our spring series as we play the last of The Whistler, The Lost Episodes. Recently uncovered episodes of The Whistler that haven't been in circulation for decades. Of course, that's not all you'll find. Uh, You'll have our Summer of Bogart or Summer of Angela Lansbury, all chosen by our Patreon supporters as well as holiday programs. And of course, we're going to have some Easter programs coming up uh, next month. So much uh, variety if you're interested in old-time radio and just kind of getting a feel for Uh, Not just one genre, but uh, kind of the breadth of old-time radio. Check it out at amazing.greatdetectives.net. And you can check out all of the different podcasts that we offer over at uh, greatdetectives.net on the homepage. Now, it is time for this week's episode of Mr. Comedian. Uh, The original air date on this one is September 22nd, 1948. And the title is The Case of the Game of Death. Tonight we again present the famous Mr. Chameleon of Central Headquarters in his most famous cases of crime and murder, brought to you by the makers of Bayer Aspirin. As all of you know, Mr. Chameleon is known in the police as Chameleon, the man of many faces, who appears in various impersonations to track down his prey. The audience always knows who Mr. Chameleon is, but the criminal he is tracking down seldom does. Tonight we give you Mr. Chameleon and the case of the game of death. The Coronet Hotel is one of Fifth Avenue's finest, but like every other building, it can harbor trouble and unhappiness. And in the elegant suite of the Cunningham sisters, Lois, the younger sister, is sitting weeping and crying out angrily to her sister, Helene. I'm not a baby. It's only 10 o'clock, Helene. I have a right to go out and enjoy myself, haven't I? No, you haven't, Lois. Not if you're going to play bridge for money. But that's ridiculous. You do it yourself all the time. Last month you paid the rent here with the money you made at bridge. Lois... You're always next door playing with the smallies. And just because they asked me to a couple of parties... You're too young for that sort of thing. You're only 20, Lois. Since Dad and Mother died, I've had to look after you. And I intend to go on doing it whether you like it or not. But the Smallies have been so kind to us. I didn't say they weren't. I simply said that I won't have you playing cards for money. I'll answer that. And don't think I've finished with you. I haven't. It may be Edgar. I hope it's Edgar. The sooner you marry him, the better I'll be pleased. Yes? Oh, hello there. What's that? Elaine! Elaine, what happened? Meanwhile, strolling along Fifth Avenue, we find Mr. Chameleon, the famous detective from Central Headquarters, the man of many disguises who has long terrorized the underworld. And with him is his friend and co-worker, Detective Sergeant Dave Arnold, also off duty. But like two war horses scenting battle, they stop simultaneously. And Dave exclaims, Mr. Chameleon, do you see what I see? I see a crowd... Two police cars in front of the Coronet Hotel. Add them all together while they spell, Dave. Trouble. Yes, come on. Ah, it looks like big trouble, Dave. Oh, there's Captain Robbins. He must be on the job. Hello, Captain. Mr. Chameleon, Dave. What's up? Plenty. A girl named Helene Cunningham, who lives here with her sister, was murdered an hour ago. Shot through the heart by someone who rang her doorbell. Oh, was she alone at the time? Our sister Lois was in the bedroom. She didn't see the murderer, but she claims it must have been someone Helene Cunningham knew because she greeted them as if she knew them. They got away, huh? 
Apparently, they ran down the stairs. Uh, did the sister Lois uh, send for the police? Well, no, Mr. Chameleon. The uh. Smalleys did that. Henry and Catherine Smalley. They have the suite next door. Well, that's them over there talking to the hotel manager. Oh, nice-looking pair. Smalley. Henry Smalley. That name sounds really familiar. Uh, do you mind if I talk to them, Captain? Right ahead, Mr. Chameleon. Uh, Dave, you wait for me, please. Okay, Mr. Chameleon. Mr. Smalley? Yes? Um... I'm not on this case officially, but my name is Chameleon, what, and I'd you like... You don't mean it. Catherine, did you hear that? This is the famous Mr. Chameleon. No, it's not possible. Why, you're young and attractive, Mr. Chameleon. From the way we heard you describe, we expected a monster with horns. I don't follow you, Mrs. Smalley. Who described me to you? And why is it that your name sounds so familiar to me? Well, let's say we have mutual acquaintances, Mr. Chameleon, who have talked about the brilliant impersonations you use when working on a case. Though... Brilliant was not the word they used. Wait a minute, I have it. You're the Henry Smalley who's done such wonderful work among men with prison records. You've gotten them jobs, hired them yourself. Am I right? I'm afraid you are, Mr. Chameleon. Uh -huh. You know, it's amazing, Mr. Chameleon, how seldom those men betray my faith in them. But uh, right now, I'm minus a secretary who vanished yesterday, taking some of the family jewels with him. Mr. Chameleon isn't interested in your stray lambs, Henry. I'm sure he's much more interested in hearing about Helene Cunningham. Oh, yes, poor Helene. It was frightful, Mr. Chameleon. We heard the shot, rushed next door, and there she was, covered with blood with her sister Lois kneeling beside her. Uh, did you know the two sisters well? We knew Helene fairly well. She used to play bridge with us. She was a beautiful girl. Can't imagine who would want to kill her. Or why? It seems so senseless, so cruel. And what will happen to little Lois? I wouldn't worry too much, dear. Little Lois will be taken care of. Uh, by whom, Mrs. Smalley? By the um, young man approaching us. Mrs. Smalley, where's Lois? How is she? I wouldn't believe it when you called me. I, I still can't believe that Helene was murdered. Lois asked me to call you, Edgar. She's still upstairs being questioned by the police. Then she needs me. Thank you for calling. Hmm. Touching, isn't he, Mr. Chameleon? Young love on a white horse is always so touching. Is he Lois Cunningham's fiancé? We presume he is. His name is Edgar Williams. She brought him to call on us several times. Well, then she will be taken care of. Yes, Mr. Chameleon, if you call being married to a nice, dull young man being taken care of. Personally, I think that Lois deserves a better fate. I think that Catherine and I should take an interest in her. <laughs> And personally, my dear Commissioner, I would just as soon have two vultures take an interest in that girl, Lois. At least vultures are honest birds of prey. But, Chameleon, do you really think this chap Smalley and his wife are card sharps? Commissioner, it's a very difficult thing to prove. They live in a high-class hotel, they dress well, they're attractive, but they give bridge parties constantly. And according to her sister, Helene Cunningham, played for money. She paid their bills that way. And she must have had better luck at cards than I do. No. No, not necessarily. Hmm? Uh, commissioner, socially, the Cunningham girls are top drawer stuff. Their parents, unfortunately, left them penniless, but they continued to keep up their standard of living. Well, how? Because Helene won occasionally at bridge? No, Commissioner, you'll never convince me of that. Then you think that the Smallies used Helene as a come-on? She introduced them to her friends. Friends with money, and then the Smallies proceeded to fleece the friends at Bridge. I think that's very possible. And when she decided to pull out, she was murdered. I think that is possible, too. But remember, a high-class gambling ring, Commissioner, is the toughest thing in the world to smash. How can you prove that a charming couple like the Smallies are card shops? If they are. And you believe they are? I believe that a lot of ugly things go with gambling. Blackmail, sometimes suicide, sometimes even murder. Now, the Smalleys are just a cog in the wheel, and I'd like to smash the wheel. Well, how are you going about it? Are you going to take up gambling, get yourself an introduction to the Smalleys' inner circle? No. No, I'd rather be part of that inner circle. What do you mean? Well, Henry Smalley's pet philanthropy is rehabilitating criminals, or so he says. Don't you think he'd rehabilitate me? You? Uh-huh. Suppose my name is Otis Smith. I've served a term in prison for forgery, but I want to go straight. Now, after all, Commissioner, Mr. Smalley is a charitable man. I'm 
sure that he'd be only too glad to help me. When Mr. Smalley sees me, it will be as Otis Smith. So your name is Otis Smith, and you served a term for forgery, eh? Six years at Leavenworth. I was released for good behavior. Mm-hmm. How old are you? Thirty-six. Oh, you look much older. Well, I should, Mr. Smalley. I got this white hair and stir, and I picked up a few other things there, too, like my limp. How did that happen? Got into a fight with another prisoner. Dropped a rock on my foot. Broke all the bones in it. Well, you had quite a bad time of it, didn't you, Mr. Smith? I learned to hate the whole world, especially organized society. Organized for what? To persecute men like me who simply try to make a living off the suckers and the fools? So you think the suckers and fools of this world are fair game for anyone who's smart enough to make a living off them? Sure I do. Don't you? I heard that you are very understanding, Mr. Smalley. I understand the criminal mentality, Mr. Smith. What do you mean by that? I mean I feel deeply sorry for you people who have been in prison, and I'd like to help you. You seem like an educated man. One year in college. Mm -hmm. You're quite presentable, too. That white hair gives you a lot of distinction. You see, my secretary ran out on me a few days ago. Poor devil, he fell in with some of his old associates and promptly skipped out with some of my wife's jewelry. I assure you, Mr. Smalley, I am not a common thief. I know. You forgers always consider yourselves artists. Now, wait a minute. I want you to meet my wife and her brother. Catherine, Claude, come in here, will you please? Yes, dear. What is it? And who is this? The forger? The gentleman who wrote you such a pathetic letter? That's right. Mr. Smith, this is my wife. And her brother, Mr. Taylor. How do you, How do, you, How do, you do, do, Mr. Smith? And now you've met the entire household. Unless you're kind enough to let me join it, Mr. Smalley. What makes you think we'd allow you to join it? Oh, I don't know. I have a hunch we'd all get on together. You're not exactly shy, are you? Uh, Mr. Smith. Yes, Mr. Taylor. I've always been extremely curious about forgers, how they work. Could you give us an example of your craft? It's an idea, Claude. How about it, Mr. Smith? You have something handy with your signature, Mr. Smalley? Yes, right here. I just made out a check to the hotel. And I'll get you some paper. No, I have some right here, thanks. I always carry a little pad around in my pocket. Prefer to use my own pen than I'm used to. Well, I suppose that does make a difference. <laughs> yes, indeed. All right, here we go. Henry, please don't stand over me. Can't what? work if you do. Why not? Come on, Claude, he's quite right. He's an artist. No artist likes to work with people watching him. Oh, shall I answer that, Henry? Uh, no, uh, I'll take it, dear. Uh, why? Jay is very tricky. Too tricky? Shh, please. Yes. M. A. L. I never saw such concentration. Please be quiet. Catherine, Claude, what do you think that was? Henry, no noise, please. It's all right, I finished. Here you are, Mr. Smalley. What do you think of that imitation of your signature? That's amazing. Hmm. I couldn't tell the difference between this and my own signature. Neither could I. You are an artist, Mr. Smith. Thank you. Unfortunately, there's no market for my art. That's why I'm... Still hoping that you can give me a job. Uh, Mr. Smith, I must tell you something. That phone call just now was from the police. Police? What? Yes. I have a shock for you. The body of Willis Evans, that's my former secretary, was found this morning on the waterfront. He'd been bludgeoned to death. So, you see, Mr. Smith, this job may mean bad luck. But if you want it, it's yours. I'll take it. Mr. Chameleon and the case of the game of death continues in just a moment. Whenever you want really quick relief from an ordinary headache or the pains of neuritis or neuralgia, get Bayer aspirin at any drugstore and take two tablets with a full glass of water at once. 
you'll be surprised how fast your suffering is relieved. Results with Bayer aspirin are quick because of its two-second disintegrating action, an action so fast that Bayer aspirin is ready to go to work almost the instant you take it. You can actually see this by dropping a Bayer aspirin tablet in a glass of water. Before it reaches the bottom of the glass, it begins to disintegrate. It does the same in your stomach, hence relief comes with amazing speed. Another point to remember about Bayer aspirin is this. Bayer aspirin has been used without ill effect by millions of normal people. So for two reasons, for amazingly fast and reliable relief, be sure to ask for Bayer aspirin by its full name, not by the name aspirin alone when you buy. Get the 100 tablet bottle and you get Bayer aspirin tablets for less than a penny apiece. And now back to Mr. Chameleon and the case of the game of death. It is a week later and we find Mr. Chameleon at central headquarters in the office of the police commissioner with Detective Sergeant Dave Arnold. As Dave says, And that's all I could dig up on the Smallies. Their source of income is certainly dubious. None of them work, not even Mrs. Smalley's brother, Claude Taylor, and Mr. Smalley's small inheritance couldn't possibly take care of them. Not at the Coronet Hotel, it couldn't. What do you say, Mr. Chameleon? Oh, no, hardly. I've been working for the Smalley's for a week now as their secretary. There's no question in my mind as to their source of income. There is also no question as to who shot Helene Cunningham. The former secretary? Mm Mm-hmm. Certainly, Commissioner. Then possibly he blackmailed them, or they felt that they couldn't trust him. So he was killed. And who do you think did that, Mr. Chameleon? I don't know, Dave. My guess is the brains of the whole outfit. That could be Smalley, or his wife, or her brother, Claude Taylor. Whoever it is, my personal ambition is to put them behind bars and keep them there. You feel very strongly on the subject, don't you, Chameleon? You know my motto, Commissioner. The innocent must be protected, the guilty must be punished. A vicious organization like this poisons innocent lives like Lois Cunningham's and... What about her? Well, I was in the kitchen last night mixing drinks in my role of Otis Smith's secretary. The Smallies were having one of their parties. And suddenly I heard someone come into the pantry. Lois and her boyfriend, Edgar Williams. Lois was saying... I can't stand it, Edgar. I've got to get out of here. But Lois, darling, what is it? There's something terrible going on here. I'm sure of it now. These card games. Edgar, they're crooked. Lois, are you out of your mind? No. Oh, I didn't want to believe it. The the Smallies were so kind to me after Helene's death. But it's true just the same. But, sweetheart, how do you know? I've never lost much money to the Smallies. I've I've won as much as I've lost. So have I. But other people have lost tremendous sums. The Carters, for instance, and Babette Dixon, and... Edgar, I introduced all those people to the Smalls. Sweetheart. Oh, Edgar, I'm afraid. Lois, the trouble with you is you need someone to look after you. You've had the jitters ever since your sister's death. I haven't told you, but someone's been following me every time I've gone out. What? Well, there's something I haven't told you. Right after Helene's death, I got a permit to carry a gun. I've got it right here with me. If anyone tries to harm you, I'll... put that gun away. All right. But at least you know now I'm able to protect you. Oh, darling, you're wonderful. Really, you are. You're the sweetest, the most naive. Naive? Yes, naive. Especially about the smallies. Oh, Edgar, Edgar, I do love you so much. I'm so terribly afraid. Lois. (coughs) Who is that? Is there someone in the kitchen? I'm... Sorry, sir, it's only me. I'm uh, Otis Smith, Mr. Smalley's secretary. What the devil were you doing there? Eavesdropping? No, sir. Well, I hope you got an earful. I hope I made it clear that I love Miss Cunningham, and I intend to protect her. And Lois Cunningham needs protection, Commissioner. Right now, she is in just as much danger as her sister was. What are you going to do about it, Mr. Chameleon? Dave, I have one little chore I want you to take care of, and then I'd better get back on the job as Smalley's secretary. They're giving another party next week. Well, Chameleon, does it occur to you that you may be in danger, too? Is that something new? Commissioner, I am determined to smash that outfit. I want to get them all. Not just the cogs in the wheel or the spokes, but the hub. 
the very heart and center of the group, the one who holds them together and makes them go round. I'm telling you, Henry. She told me she was finally convinced we were crooked. Even if she can't prove it, she can warn her friends against us. She'll frighten everyone away. What's that? Someone closed the door. Who is it? I, Mr. Smalley. Otis Smith. Sorry I'm late. Well, we were beginning to worry about you, Otis. Weren't we, Catherine? Yes, we were. Where were you all afternoon? I had some shopping to do. You were gone a long time. Just where were you shopping? Oh, what's the matter? Don't you trust me? Otis, we've had an extremely disturbing afternoon. First, Catherine had an unhappy scene with Lois Cunningham, and then Claude comes home with news about you. About me? Claude, come in here, will you? Yes. Oh, he's back. Yes. Tell him what you found out. I found out that you've been lying to us. Lying? Of course you've been lying, and you didn't get away with it. Mrs. Smalley, Mr. Taylor... In what way have I been lying? You lied about your prison record. My brother-in-law checked on it, and you're a second offender. Oh, that... Do you mean to say you don't realize how very serious that can be? If you're sent up once more, you may be in for life. That's why you should have thought twice before you forged my name on a check. You kidding? I never forged your name, Mr. Taylor. I have the check right here. I'll swear I never made it out. I'll swear to it in court. And you'll go up for life. No! No, I, I couldn't stand that. Five years of it nearly finished me, nearly went nuts. In that case, maybe you'd be interested in a proposition. Okay, what's the deal? Anything but go back to prison. Do you carry a gun, Otis? Well, sure I carry a gun. Oh, I get it. Lois Cunningham, huh? Been wondering about that babe. Thought you were taking an awful chance letting her run around loose. Well? All right. Don't like that kind of job, but what the heck? We all got to do things we don't like occasionally. Now, look, Dave. You stay out here by the stairs. Don't come crashing in unless you have a shot. Mr. Chameleon, I feel so blasted useless. You have been anything but useless. That last bit of information you dug up was priceless. May turn the trick. You think they'll all be there? They'll be right at my heels. They're going to make sure I pull off this job, that I kill Lois Cunningham. And if I don't, then they'll try to kill me, or at least one of them will. And whoever does that is the one that we're looking for. Now, here is Lois Cunningham's apartment. See you later, Dave, I hope. Good luck, Otis Smith. Yes? Oh, Mr. Smith. Let me in, quick. Thank heavens you're here, Mr. Williams. Did you think I wouldn't be when you phoned me and said Lois was in danger? I came immediately. Good boy, shut the door, will you? But don't lock it. I may want to get out in a hurry. Edgar? Oh, Mr. Smith, it's you. Why did you call Edgar and say I was in danger? Because you are, Miss Cunningham. Edgar. It's all right, sweetheart. I'm here. I won't let him hurt you. Oh, I don't intend to hurt him, Mr. Williams. See, that's the point. I've got quite a story to tell you, kid. But first, I uh, got a favor to ask you, Mr. Williams. I know you have a gun. We should put it on the table. What? What do you think? I'm crazy? No, I'm willing to lay mine on the table. Now, there, there you are. See, there's mine. Please, Mr. Williams, I feel much safer. A kid like you isn't used to handling guns. Go ahead, darling. I want to hear what he has to say. Very well, Lois. There. Now, Smith, tell us about the Smalleys. Well, as you know, I've been working as their secretary. This afternoon, they gave me orders to bump off Miss Cunningham. What? Then they were responsible for Helene's death, too. Sure they were responsible. They... Someone closed the outside door. The Smalleys. Edgar. Here, Mr. Williams, here's your gun. Now we're ready for him. Come on out. We know you're there. No funny business either. Mr. Williams and I both got guns. 
So you went back on us, did you, Smith, you dirty little punk? We should have known you would. We never should have trusted you. Never trust a forger. You mean never trust a card sharp, Smalley. That's the way I've always heard it. Be careful, my friend. If you go to the police... Don't move. You stay right where you are, all three of you. You got them covered, Mr. Williams? You bet I have. Good. Because I want them to stand there and listen. I want them to listen carefully, not miss a word. I not only have enough on you to send you to jail... I know which one of you is the head of the whole gambling ring. What? You heard me. The party in question is a cold-blooded individual without nerves or heart. Plays a fine game of bridge. Started playing young. Expelled from school at 16 for cheating at cards. Thrown out again during the first year of college. The name, as you know... Edgar! Is... What are you doing? Shut Edgar! up, boss! What's the matter with this gun? What's the matter with it? It's empty, Mr. Williams. I switched guns on you. I gave you mine. They're just alike, as you can see now. Why, you... Put it down. That's the time you played the wrong card. You shouldn't have tried to kill me. I was pretty sure you would. Edgar! Are you accusing me of being head of this... this ratty outfit? Me? Yeah, you, Mr. Williams. You, with your boyish face and your naive charm. Served you well, too, haven't they? Even fooled this poor girl, Lois. Well, I've had my eye on you ever since Detective Sergeant Arnold dug up your school record. But I don't understand. What has Detective Sergeant Arnold to do with you? Are you a stool pigeon? No, just a detective. You know, that um, monster that some of your jailbird friends told you about. Chameleon. Chameleon. Yes, I'm Chameleon of the cops. Doing the perfect impersonation of Otis Smith Forger. Well, thank you, Smalley. <laughs> And the whole thing is over with, Mr. Chameleon. Edgar confessed? Yes, Lars, they all confessed. Or rather, they all accused each other. And Edgar, he even planned my sister Helene's death. Yes. Oh. I know it's a difficult thing to face, but it's better this way. You're young, Lois. You'll fall in love again. Oh, no, never. Yes, you will, my dear. Take my word for it. And don't hate me too much. I don't hate you, Mr. Chameleon. I'm very grateful if I'd ever married Edgar. Exactly. And I had to get him, too. You see, I couldn't let him go free to continue his criminal activities. I could have run in the others in the gang long before I did. I wanted to wait and get the top card in the pack. <laughs> And with these words, Mr. Chameleon concludes tonight's murder case. Here's something it will pay you to keep in mind whenever you're suffering from an ordinary headache and want really fast relief. Because genuine bear aspirin starts disintegrating in your stomach, Within two seconds after you take it, it quickly relieves the pain. Actually, this remarkable two-second disintegrating action means that Bayer aspirin is ready to go to work almost instantly. And that's important. For when you're suffering, you want fast relief, very fast relief. And you also want relief you can depend upon. And here again, that means Bayer aspirin. For of all pain relievers, none can match Bayer aspirin's record of use by millions of normal people without ill effect. So when you buy, do as millions do. Ask for genuine Bayer aspirin. Get the 100 tablet bottle and you get Bayer aspirin tablets for less than a penny apiece. Listen next Wednesday night at this same time for Mr. Chameleon, the man of many faces, in the case of the jewels of death. 
The part of Mr. Chameleon is played by Carl Swenson, with dialogue by Marie Balmer, from the original story by Frank and Ann Hummer. Music directed by Victor Arden. Your announcer is Dan Seymour. New Lion's toothpaste does what no other toothpaste can. Thousands of laboratory tests on scores of individual teeth reveal that New Lion's toothpaste actually gets teeth two and a half to five and a half times brighter than any of the five leading brands, brighter by far, in fact, than any toothpaste on the market. Remember, it's not just another toothpaste, not just another old toothpaste with an added ingredient. Lion's toothpaste is utterly new, radically different. It cleans without soap, polishes without chalk. Lion's toothpaste. Listen for Mr. Chameleon, the new mystery drama in the case of the Jewels of Death, next Wednesday night at this time. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Welcome back. I actually thought the character he invented for this particular episode was one of the better ones he did. Uh, And I thought fairly well thought out. And you can say that Chameleon doesn't just say, hey, I'm going to be an ex-con. He's like, okay, I'm this type of ex-con, and this is his history, and really also considers the motivation. And uh, it's not something where if, you know, Carl Swenson would or voicing like a character role on another program, I'd think, oh, that's Carl Swenson. So I thought that was really good. And if they didn't have the whole, you know, the audience is always going to know thing, could have fooled me. I mean, I think Swenson's a good enough actor that, you you know, you could have done a series where it was a mystery to the audience who Mr. Chameleon was. The solution was a surprise. I didn't see it coming, but that's probably partially because uh, there wasn't really uh, an example of what mystery fans call fair play. We did not know everything that Chameleon knew. Now, of course, I don't think that the audience for Mr. Chameleon was really expecting to follow along and solve it. But I, I think the problem with having such a major piece of information kept from the audience is it doesn't feel like he's particularly clever. It's just he knew something we didn't know. I mean, I I would not have been at all surprised if I had the information he had. But since I didn't, it was like, what? You know, no, nobody was looking at this guy as a suspect. Again, a bit of sleight of hand, but I did enjoy the episode. All right, well, now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. And I want to thank Thomas. Thomas has been one of our Patreon supporters since July 2016, currently supporting us at the Detective Sergeant level of $7.14 or more per month. Again, thanks so much for your support, Thomas. That'll do it for today. If you are enjoying this podcast on YouTube, YouTube, be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and mark the notification bell. But we will be back next Tuesday with another episode of Mr. Chameleon. And coming up tomorrow, it's time for some adventure with that intrepid man called X where... The body is right there, Mr. Thurston, in the morgue. Thanks, Doctor. You haven't been able to identify him? No, no papers, wallet, laundry marks, nothing. I see Well, Mr. Thurston, do you know him? No. No, I don't. Never saw him before in my life. Makes it even more strange, doesn't it? This insistence of his upon seeing you. Any scars, broken bones, physical characteristics that might help us? Only that scar tissue on his legs and feet. Frostbite? Yes. Another recent, too. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, I did notice some peculiar calluses on the thumb and middle finger of his left hand. Here. You can see them quite plainly. Yes. All right, Doctor, thanks. 
Anything else we can do for you? I'd like to use a private office if you don't mind. One with the telephone. Of course. Do you want to call the authorities in Tokyo? No, the Bureau, New York. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.